So let's go then with the, with the speakers. Okay. Uh, our first speaker for the night is Varun Nayan. Good enough. <laughs> Naya. Uh, he's going to be talking today about a very interesting topic, a, a recurrent topic recently, because the last talk was also about digestion. So you have a very high bar to pass today after the talk from Michael Benacourt. Very much. And um, you're going to take a very practical approach to the problem. Uh, not going to focus only the theory, that is probably where many talks and many discussions stop. And the importance of Bayesian methods uh, comes because it helps to explain things that uh, other models like deep learning uh, are not so successful in doing and also require much more data to, to provide good results. No? Bayesian help us in this small data set and uh, importance of high understandability of the, of the model uh, state. Uh, your CV is quite, quite diverse. Um. You've been quite busy with a lot of the stuff. You are proud of being a data scientist before the, the <laughs> world existed, right? Yeah, it was called data mining when I got involved. <laughs> yeah, was less, less statistics probably. Yeah, I mean, I, I think of myself as a statistician, really. <laughs> every just, there's new, new titles forming up every year, so. so. <laughs> and you've been involved in startups, high frequency trading, and even the parliament. Yeah, yeah you have actually have a slide towards discussing my minor achievement. <laughs> It was a very short contract and analysis. <laughs> we will not hold that against you. That's I appreciate fine. it. Anyway, without further introductions, uh, please uh, welcome uh, Barun. Thanks, everyone. All right, uh, firstly, can everyone hear me okay? I uh, can't really tell when the mics are on. All good? Okay, cool. I'm going to take the, I've seen like three people say yes, that's good enough for me. Anyway, so we're going to first talk of like, so I think Bayesian inference. So. This talk is gonna be a few things, but roughly the idea here is, I'm gonna treat you as like, I don't need Bayesian inference, change my mind. That is a talk summed up in a meme. But more explicitly, I'm gonna talk about a few things. I'm gonna talk about what exactly is Bayesian inference? What are the advantages of Bayesian inference? What are the disadvantages of Bayesian inference? And finally, how do you get started doing Bayesian inference in your current job? Okay, so to start off with a little bit of a joke here, so how do you know someone is Bayesian? The answer is, is it their, you know, their peerless wit? Is it their sharp insight into data? Is it their incredible programming skills? I mean, it's all of the above, but it's also mostly, they'll tell you. <laughs> Bayesians <laughs> are pretty much, um, you know, the vegan crossfitters of the statistics community. I, I know, unironically begin many of my sentences with, as a Bayesian, and I expect people to follow me. So <laughs> that's kind of how you know. So to the five Bayesians in the audience, I'm kind of gonna, I'm gonna go through a very, very quick talk on Bayesian inference. From, for, as explained to someone who's not got a good sense of it. So the question is, okay, so about me, Jose's already quickly done this, talked about my background study. If I'm actually pretty op uh, active in open source as well. So anyone who uses Python and draws histograms in the regular, and if you use bins equals auto, that's a feature I added to NumPy a while back. So that's basically my only claim to fame. <laughs> so anyway, what is Bayesian stats? And like, I'm gonna start a really, really basic and why do I have to do that? I've been coming to these meetups meet for a few months now and asked the question a few times, and this is the response I usually get. And it's not exactly a response I can kind of like, you know, assume and build on. And I think trying to understand what Bayesian inference is about allows me to kind of build on and actually discuss the concepts and ideas that go into inference. So the first thing, God, every time this feels, um, yeah. So the first thing I need to talk about, so what is Bayesian inference and what it's not? So the first thing, Bayes rule. Everyone, start, everyone acts as, I use Bayes' rule, I'm now a Bayesian. That is the furthest thing from the truth possible. Bayes' rule does not make you a Bayesian. I've actually used it primarily for interviews when people ask me questions about like, you know, like infection rates and false positive rates. I've actually never really used it when doing Bayesian inference all that much. I use it for trivia. And it's also used in a naive Bayes classifier. Bayes' rule is actually, if you go into an extreme purist Bayesian view of things, it's actually just, you know, how Bayesian inference is described to a frequentist. The pride, the likelihood, and you know, they're probably doing it correct as XKZD points out, is that. So this is just Bayes' rule. It's a simple idea, we've seen this millions of times, and never really engage with it. I know most of the time, at least for most of my university study, I just get involved and be like, okay, I'm done for the, I'm done for the moment. Is it priors? It's not priors. I think this is the other thing that gets everyone really stuck on priors. As Calvin takes, puts it here, we kind of like assume prize by faith. And I think this is a huge issue that everyone's like, no, 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 how do we add prize? How do we add information? Statistics should be purely from the data. And I think this is a very philosophical issue that I can go into extreme depth. 
But there's like the whole, if you think about it, priors are really unimportant. You know, we have ideas of uninformed priors, we have conjugate priors, which just make analysis easy. We have priors that aren't, you know, that can give us reg like stuff like a ridge regression, a lasso regression, just by using priors. And I actually think something like ridge regression is much easier to understand from a Bayesian perspective. Um, and you can actually see, even in pop culture, priors are like the most important thing for some reason. Here, XKCD has the famous, did the sun explode? The things, and here's how, um, Another taken from Saturday SNBC, where the Bayesian, who's been bitten by a vampire, has such a low prior that vampires exist. He actually ends up dying before he realizes he's a vampire. And there's, there's two different takes you can take on the prior. And I, I actually really don't like the XKCD comic, but I think the SNBC comic just, just sort of like touches on what priors are. Priors are not even part of the thing. They're just like, they, they're either a bug or a feature, depending on how you choose it. It's on MCMCs. So we had a huge talk on uh, about Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. And Hamiltonian Monte Carlo are, is really important um, to, you know, to Bayesian inference. And I kind of equate it similar to how GPUs and neural nets are sort of tied together. You don't need a GPU to train a neural net, but you're gonna be waiting here for like the next thousand years <laughs> if you want to teach a neural net. That's what the advantage is. MCMCs provide a way of doing inference. They're not, they're just, they're not actually Bayesian inference. It's a big part, but not the most important thing. So MCMC is a Markov chain Monte Carlo. I will not be explaining what it is because that's a whole other talk in itself, which we already had. So the other thing, is it a likelihood? So again, going back to the Bayes inference, we had the likelihood times the posterior. It underpins all statistics. If you're doing maximum likelihood methods, you're finding the, calculating the likelihood function. The likelihood function is part of any kind of Bayesian inference to try and up, do the Bayesian updating. It's kind of where these ideas overlap. But again, frequent, the whole idea of the likelihood doesn't really get into the idea of Bayesianism at all. It just sort of dances around it. Is it the posterior? So now we're getting a bit closer. The posterior is what a lot of the Bayesian inference seems to end up at. We got a posterior, I'm, I'm calling it a day. We've done it. And it is a very, very big part. But the thing is, you can use the posterior to do frequent distance inference. There's a technique called maximum a posteriori, which is equivalent to the maximum likelihood estimator when we use uniform priors. This means that a posterior does not necessarily give you Bayesian inference. However, the difference between an MLE and a posterior is that an MLE is a single point while a posterior is a proper distribution. And this is where we get into the difference between what exactly is Bayesian statistics. So to use the example here, Bayesian statistics versus frequentism. So this is the full, this is the one slide thing that's gonna just explain the difference once and for all. So frequentists believe there is a true distribution and then that data is just a random observation from that true distribution. Bayesian, however, we kind of think that there is, the data is fixed, but our certainty or our, uh, our belief in the, of the parameters underlying changes. And so think about it in two different ways, tossing a coin. When you toss a coin 10 times, each time the data is pronounced, produced by the coin's you know, probability of actually showing up heads. And, but the, each if it has a 50% chance of showing up heads each time, we're gonna get the binomial distribution, it's sort of random. Meanwhile, the Bayesians believe that every time we toss a head up 10 times, we have sort of an idea of what P is, but it's not, we're not quite certain. We think it could be 0.2, it could be 0.5, but at each of these are different values of certainty. Frequentism is all about point estimates, while Bayesianism is about characterizing the distributions. So this is better explained in this slide here. So I've got a nice little picture. So I have a bias toying cost here. So 99% confidence intervals. So the left side is a frequentist side, the right side is a Bayesian inference. So this is actually, for, I think for the, this is the way I think everyone should explain confidence intervals. So in the confidence intervals, I have a coin that is biased. It only shows up head three, three times in 10, 0.3. And I toss it 10 times and I draw my estimate for p hat and the confidence interval. And the red dot, dotted line represents the true value of p. And here we can actually see that of the 10 confidence intervals I've drawn, only one of them does not go through the true value. And that is what a 90% confidence interval is. If you drew 100 confidence intervals, 90% confidence intervals, 10 of those confidence intervals would not contain the true parameter. That is what a confidence interval is. Anything else that you've been thinking of till today has been wrong. But confidence intervals are confusing, so I forgive you. On the Bayesian, in fact, however, we have a different approach. So we have the same data we see. We see two in 10, and our belief in the various values of P changes depending on that. So we can see that, you know, for 0.2, it's maximized because that we have a uniform prior. But for like other values, 0.5 is still possible, but unlikely. However, like something like 0.1 is much more likely because it's much closer to what we've observed. Bayesianism, we kind of have this distribution. We have a different belief in each value of P. And that's, that's, that's key. Why is it key? So let's talk about the posterior predictive. 
So given my data x, how do I predict the next batch of data that I see? And so this is, this is the only equation I've included, so <laughs> forgive me for it. But we have this equation here, which is called the posterior predictive equation. And we actually take, do our inference by integrating across the posterior. And the basic idea here is that we are doing what is almost basically the ultimate ensemble model. Going back to my example from before, for p equals to 0.2, we have a likelihood. We see what's the binomial distribution of p equals to 0.2 and weighted by how likely it is. Then we take p equals to 0 0.21, 0 0.22, all the way and so forth. So we are actually averaging across the entire, our entire knowledge, our uncertainty. We're actually, in this, in this way, we're able to propagate our knowledge of uncertainty through. In the frequentist approach, if you had two tosses in 10, 200 tosses in 1,000, your prediction would still be the same, the point two. You don't get to actually propagate your uncertainty through in any way. And this is actually shown really, really clearly in the posterior predictive. So my green line is the frequentist line and the red line is the Bayesian line. And you can see that the frequentist line peaks really, really high at point two. It's really, really so sure, it's really, really certain. Well, the, the Bayesian version has taken into account that I'm not that sure, I've only tossed it 10 times. And it's been a lot more, less, lot less cons more conservative, it's a lot less like, you know what, spread out a bit more. And you can see this as I increase the number of data points. So red equals 10 tosses, green equals 20 tosses, and blue is 50 tosses. Each time I'm getting point to the number of heads. And you can see here in my, my posterior predictive, my ability to, um, my disability, my prediction of p equals to 2 keeps getting stronger because the more tosses I have, the more information I have. I'm propagating uncertainty through. And that's a very, very powerful idea. We're not, and this is, this is, this is a very simple toy example. So yeah, not, you know, like, there are no mind shattering old realizations to be had here. But it's a very powerful idea that we can build on. So I think we're getting to the meat of the real thing that I want to talk about, which is why should we do Bayesian statistics? The first thing I want to talk about is that it's intuitive. A lot of our intuition about p-values, about confidence intervals, is all mostly wrong. Our intuition doesn't, and frequentism don't mesh well together. But the way that you think about uh, Bayesian inference, uh, the way you think about uh, your intuition, it really, it just default matches up to the, B, the Bayesian inference idea. In fact, for the longest time, Bayesian inference was the default way of doing statistics. It was called inverse probability, and it took till Ronald Fisher and Neymar, and Neymar um, basically shot all over it and got rid of it for about 100 years. Um, to look at it, let's see, I went through a bit too fast, intuitive. We have normal p-values. We can just look at a posterior and tell you what is the likelihood of this existing. There's no idea of this null hypothesis that we must reject. In frequent statistics, we can't do, we don't ever find evidence for a hypothesis. We only find evidence against a hypothesis. So I have my null and my alternative, I reject the null. What if I want to have more than one hypothesis? How do I test, te test against that? How do I test across models? This is all not questions that are answered well within frequentism. And and Bayesianism, by just talking about what's the prop, by just having posteriors and having probabilities, become really, really intuitive to understand and really easy to combine together. Things like overfitting are actually much harder to do in the Bayesian sense. Of course, it's still possible. We can always find ways to ruin things that we do, but it's still harder than the frequent sense where you can just fall into it by, mis by mistake. Bayesian A-B testing, for anyone who works on the internet, internet companies, it's really, really good because um, you, know, you don't actually have to wait for the full long length of time. You can peak. You can stop the test study early, which you can't do with a frequentist A-B test. Other ideas, it's flexible. Frequentism has a lot of underlying assumptions that we just take for granted. We have like, okay, in a, free, linear, in a linear regression doing least squares, we have to have uh, normal distributed errors. That's not always the case. I've once, had, when I worked at Cochlear, we had really, really quantized error. By that, I mean every, all the errors in steps, so it wasn't really actually normally distributed. Summary statistics are really normally, normally distributed. You also have issues where you may want to change the, the distributions of anything to give you different results. And you just can't do that. There are all these inherent assumptions in, line, in frequent statistics that aren't shown to you. Bayesianism kind of opens it all up and lets you do whatever you want with it. Um, it's all, yeah, and that's, I think, it's very flexible. And I think I'm going to show an example why I think. So let's talk about, here's my first example of the night, Anscombe's third quartet. So everyone's seen Anscombe's, the four Anscombe court, um, data points, which talk about how linear regression can be changed quite a bit. So here we have my, um, the blue line represents my true regression, while the red line represents what linear least squares does. Least squares cannot handle that extra, extra point. And so here I am, I'm gonna say, and why is that? Because the summary statistics of the data, and assuming that the, the, the distributions are normally distributed, results in that point having high leverage and pulling the distribution away. So, but let's say, instead of saying that my errors are normally distributed, I'm gonna make them t-distributed. I'm just, because I can. And that's actually why I included the t-distributed line. 
So you can see the T distribution is a little bit less centered than the normal distribution. It's a bit more spread out. What does that result in? So I'm going to just change it. This is now my model. So this is how least squares does it. That's how my, my T distribution. And I can do that. There is no answer for doing this in the frequentist sense. You have to do it with all the inherent assumptions available. Bayesian doesn't require that. And boom, I get my posteriors. So my posteriors always responded in like, a, in like a histogram, basically, because I'm trying to see what possible values can it take. And we see here that alpha, which is our intercept, and beta, which is our actual uh, slope, are sort of centered around like 3 and 0.5, which is the exact same as the normal distribution we saw before. While our t distribution is just bang, it's fixed on the true value. It's really, really certain because it allows for a greater distribution a bit further away from the actual center. It's no longer as affected by the outlier as, as expected. And to plot that all out, if I just took a bunch of samples, we can see that the Bayesian version is still is very similar to the normal distribution from before. <laughs> the, I mean, the least version before, but my t version is now a robust regression. So anyone who's done kind of any study into robust regression, robust regression is non-trivial. And I've just done that with literally one line of change in my Bayesian modeling code. It's very, very powerful. It's very, very flexible to do things like that. And it's just a really simple thing. Uh, why is why not there? I feel like I've just jumped a few slides. I'm going to come back to that. <laughs> anyway, so the next side of why, model versus complexity. So this is a kind of an issue that a lot of data scientists and ML practitioners have to face. When do I add, when I, what happens when I just up the number of, you know, in the neural net sense, just adding more layers? What does that do? What if I don't have enough layers? Can it capture the complexity of my actual data set? And this is how you come across these interesting issues like pathological likelihoods. Pathological likelihoods are basically like, you know, you have things like, like that. You don't have clear minima or maxima. And you know the problem with optimization techniques is that they come across the first hill and they're like, you know what, I'm done for the day. This is the hill that I will die on. That is the problem with all optimization techniques. It's simply an issue there. And if you have a lot of them, you're going to have to run to that issue. You have this initial conditions dependency. Where you start depends on where you end up. And you'll see that a lot in how we do initializations in a lot of our work. And this is kind of re generally representative of, the comple of a model being very, very complex and not enough data to really model it well. Or it's a bad fit. Similar, another, on the other side of this coin, and you can, this is actually, these two are not necessarily um, uh, mutually exclusive. You can have flat likelihoods and pathological data. But flat likelihoods is your data set, your model is terrible at describing your, your, your data. And that's sometimes the thing you just have to deal with. You don't always have a perfect model, but if you can get a good enough result, that's sometimes better than no result whatsoever. And this is the thing, and you have a flat likelihood, you have this issue where your models don't fit really well because of how you sample the data. So to cross around the, the, your maximum likelihood estimator, instead of being around a well-defined peak, it's going to just jump around the whole parameter space quite a bit. Not very helpful. And this is sort of issues that you do come across if you do some certain, certain areas of study. Another thing, small data sets. Everyone's talking about deep learning and like, oh yeah, Google. You need a humongous amount of data, label data. And I don't know about you, but I don't think a lot of people actually have enough label data of that of quantity to actually do good deep learning. Deep learning, I think, is a really good answer for stuff like reinforcement learning. It's good if you're Google scale. I don't think it's really great for like the average work that most people do. And like you have this issue with cross-validation. If you have a small data set, like 2,000 rows, you can't really just throw your usual ideas at it. You can't do cross-validation. You can't say, let me keep out 10%. 10% is 200 data sets. You have this one on root and error. You aren't able to detect effects easily when your test set is so small. And similarly, if you do 1,000, 1,000, again, you still have the same issue. Your ability to identify effects has been reduced significantly by the size of your data set. I personally believe that if you're doing cross-validation, you need something like at least 20,000 rows, 20,000 point data points to be able to do that. Overfitting to your sample is far more likely as well. Because you kind of like, you know, here, especially if you just draw from a real, like a large thing, like one example is surveys, political surveys. You know, it's topical since we just had an election and I work for Parliament. <laughs> um, so we had this idea where, you know, survey, um, <clears throat> so what do you call it? So yeah, we have, we're trying to draw this uh, inference from a really, really small data set that, um, that represents a very large data set. And you can get this whole issue. You have issues of p-hacking because you need to find those data set, you, know, you need the whole data set to actually do good inference. And you end up trying to like, oh, let me test this theory, let me test this theory. Without knowing it, you just started p-hacking and you found a spurious correlation. Frequentism just allows you to walk into all these traps without even thinking about it. Other things to be concerned about is CLT convergence. Sometimes your, er your errors or your distributions aren't actually normally distributed. And you can't make, and the, the, all the normal, normality assumptions we find 
don't really hold in small data sets as well, depend, especially in, if your distributions are kind of weird. Um, Talk about initialization methods. I feel like this is something that everyone just accepted and no one really complains about. I think it's insane that we have, t we have papers written on how to initialize your neural net or your, your gas mixture model. All these techniques we have, why, do we need, why are we so dependent on initial conditions? You know, this paper in particular says, all right, I'm going to do a Gaussian mixture model. This is my classification rate when I do it randomly. And the red line is when I do it with my own specific method. We have papers, as I said, just designed. Someone says, OK, I'm just going to find the best starting point. That's insane. We should not be, you know, we talk about statistics being this kind of like informal arbiter of data. Like, why, do we, why should we care about initialization methods? And, you know, we have k-means for GMM. We have the Xavier initialization, which are, of course, still randomized. But still kind of like, you know, it's, it's kind of weird that we still depend on that. And I think it's something no one really questions. And let's so jump into another example. So here I have an example that sort of ties all this together. We have emotion recognition in speech. Here we have 6,000 rows, 13 dimensions. We are trying to mix, model with Gaussian mixture models. So for those who have never seen a Gaussian mixture model, you kind of get two mixtures, two Gaussians that sort of combine together. But you only really see the blue data. And you want to try and work out what that data is underneath. Sometimes the parameters are important. Other times, just being able to characterize the distribution. Summing Gaussians together is really a simple technique to sort of give you a good, a good, understand, good um, idea of what the data looks like. Problem here is we have a, a kind of flat, flat data. This, this model is terrible at describing emotions. We have, like, you know, when we run expectation maximization, which is the typical frequentist method, we get data everywhere. And, you know, our results go all over the place. While, um, Gaussian, well, you know, if <clears throat> what else do you have? Yeah, and that's just kind of like, that's just not very good. And like, you know, we have a pathological issue that we just get stuck in all these different minima all over the place. So let's, have, let's try and get, let's talk about it in the Bayesian sense. Let's look at a mixture model. So this is a mixture model that is the sum of two Gaussians. Um, so it's a Gaussian centered at mu equals two and mu equals three. So we have this interesting, first of all, we see, and this is the, and on the right is my posterior. So this actually describes where does mu one and mu two live. And we actually get one of the interesting problems with Bayesian inference, which is label switching. Mu1 and mu2 are not ordered, so they can kind of, you can have, you basically have peaks at two, at mu2, mu3, mu sorry, mu, mu equals 2, 3, or 3, 2. Um, look at that. And we also, I've also included in this plot in the orange crosses what our frequency inference is. And here we have 256 data points. We have a really good understanding of the data. The data is really well modeled, really, really clean. Now we get, we got good EM inference. Now what happens when our data gets a bit smaller? So now I'm at 64 data points. We still have, you know, a pretty clear posterior. We can tell that the peaks are at 2, 3, and 3, 2. But now we can see some orange crosses in the center, at one at 3, 2.5, 2.5. We now know our model is losing the ability to tell where exactly is the best fit. And we've gone from always getting a really good fit to not getting such a great fit. And finally, let's drop it down to 16 points. And now our posterior becomes a bit like a blur because we just don't have enough confidence over the two, three. And we get our expectation maximization results, the crosses, have this huge range. They just could go from anything from that entire line. And this is kind of, situa this is kind of the intuitive explanation of the situations we could be in when you're doing, trying to do like, you know, inference with a bad model and very little data. What do you do? Which is your best, vis which is your best result? And you know, you're not actually, in, in either of these cases, most of the time you're not getting the true value. You're only getting, um, you're, getting, you're getting some kind of alternative thing that may predict well, but it's actually not very good. So let's just, and so let's look at the result here. So in the AM result, the top bar is what you get when you use frequentist. And the error bar is kind of, just, it's, this is actually, it's not a confidence interval, but the full range of results you get when cross-validating. And you can see we have a very, very large range. You go all the way from like 35 to 45%. And that happens with a smaller data set and a full data set as well. Well, the Bayesian inference, which is the, gray, which is the orange, the orange square, and you can barely see the, conf, the what do you call the confidence intervals there. It is much, much more consistent. It has builds a true model, and by having a small underlying subset, we can actually more confidently say the Bayesian, for this model, the Bayesian inference version gives a much, much better sense of things. So I'm sorry I haven't really described how to build this model. It's a little more complex than time allows. I want to talk a little bit about causality. No one really discusses causality very much in a frequentist set. Causality, obviously correlation is not causation, we all know that. But the thing is causality is directed. If A causes B, A and B will be correlated. But if you get data sets A and B, you can't really tell from a statistics point of view uh, the, what's the causality here. But however, you do have this ability to combine ideas. To, you, if you have more than a set of data, 
Let's say you have voting. You want to see, does age cause vote? What, what causes a person to vote a certain way? Is it their age? Is it their home ownership? Is it their income? All of these are different kind of predictors, but all may be correlated. Someone who's a bit older may end up voting, you know, may already have a higher salary and have a home ownership just by virtue of having lived longer and earned more. Well, that, you know, there's this correlation. And by trying to like pr just do the simplest frequentist approach of just regressing everything together, you only find the best predictor. Frequentism doesn't actually investigate causality, it investigates prediction and correlation. And what that means is that, let's say you're a political party and you decide all, all you, you make bad inference, you can't intervene correctly. Being able to intervene on the actual cause is sometimes sort of an important question. And causality is a huge kind of thing that I don't think frequentism has even a half decent answer to. And then there's, I mean, I want to also add the point that causality can be really difficult. Like, one of the uh, concepts is that you're just regressing every single factor to control may cause confounds by themselves. For example, one of the really interesting sort of paradoxes you come across is the idea that, okay, if you go to a restaurant and you see it's, in, it's a hole in the wall in a really crappy location, you know it has to be good, right? Because well, it's just your kind of instinct. Similarly, if you see like a restaurant on a really nice occasion, you know, like Barangaroo or something, it's generally not so good. So you've kind of formed in your head this model of this correlation that good location equals bad food and vice versa. That's an ex that is a correlation. And you know, when you predict that, you know, location equals bad food quality is the first thing a frequentist model will spit out. But however, you completely ignore another feature here. There's a selection bias inherent because there's, a, there's another feature called what's surviving. A bad restaurant in a bad location is never going to survive. While a, good rest a bad restaurant in a good location can survive. So you have this entire extra like, you know, parameter we haven't even observed, we haven't included, that's caused confounds. Trying to understand this you know, causality is a very, very complex idea. And, you know, and just doing regressions doesn't give you the true answer. And to talk about my example, you know, we have just, this is kind of what the frequentist approach would be, just regress everything together. We don't actually at, at all truly ask questions about causality. We're just throwing things together until they fit. Maybe you throw some interaction terms. But again, let's say we have small data sets. We can't really do that. Causality is not explained well. And, as I, and to talk about like my previous thing, what happens if you have a structure like that? Age in, affects income, which affects home ownership, which affects your vote. If, if we realize that home ownership is a big thing, you know, maybe a, a government that wants to you know, like increase its vote share can work on that. But if you get bad causality, you intervene on the wrong thing. And you know, any kind of problem, any kind of company that has to deal with people and data always wants to know causality. They don't necessarily want to know this is correlated with that. Prediction is one part of the game. Causality is another big question. And Bayesian inference talks about this in terms of idea called Bayes nets. So I don't, don't know if anyone's heard about probabilistic graphical models. It's getting a bit of air time today nowadays. And this is kind of a different idea. We have this ability to sort of change our structure. So we can say, oh yeah, our structure of voting looks a lot like that. Let us you know, use the conditional distributions and the, the directed graphs to actually investigate what the causality is. Um, we have, you know, we can actually test different structures. We can discover structures. We can actually discover, uh, and the posteriors we get out of these um, nodes give us information on the causality. That's very, very powerful. And also, like when I talked about the effect, the, un the t effect of like survivability, that's a thing that we see a lot. Like when another study that was really, really interesting, we see how um, children um, succeed as, as a factor of their, you know, their parents and their suburb. But there's an unidentified factor, which is their success of their grandparents. And that's not modeled, and you get bad inference again. You can, causality is a very, very difficult problem. Frequentism doesn't have a good answer. And Bayesianism has a better answer. It actually has an answer that I consider valid, unlike frequentism. Um, another nice, interesting idea, which I like, is called leaking info or hierarchical modeling. Hierarchical modeling is a li it's pretty simple. It's kind of like, we have this idea, like we're modeling similar things constantly. We're really like modeling something completely new each time. Why doesn't our models remember state? I mean, and now you can throw transfer learning recurrent nets at me. And yes, for certain class of problems, that's the thing. What happens again if you have small data sets? And you have this idea of hierarchical modeling. So you have, we talk about the prior and Bayesian statistics giving us like, you know, an area where to look. A hierarchical modeling is a way to sort of develop a prior that learns from all the information and combines it together. So um, let's talk about this example case study. I have ACT voting. ACT voting is um, an issue because I have some news poll data. It's about 2,000 people, of which 30 people are from Canberra. That's not a lot of people. I can't do good inference on it. My confidence intervals are quite large. I don't actually know which party's in front. From this, um, actually from this, it's reasonable that the Greens are leading or the independents are leading. I have no ability to actually make good inference. 
And if you go to the news poll website, the news poll will actually not give you inference about ACT or Northern Territory. But we know that people have votes similarly together. So we have this ability to sh build a hierarchical model. And I'm able to build a model that predicts a labor vote for ACT. And instead of the large 30% range, I've reduced it to about like 15 to 20%. I have a much, much cleaner sense of how labor vote in ACT is going to go by using hierarchical modeling. You don't have to do that way. You have to think about like, what about also going across time domain? Every time I do a survey every week, I can combine that information together. I can learn. I don't have to constantly just look at everything in just a simple um, binomial sense. Another example is hierarchical Northern Territory. Here my lib vote is minuscule, but my prior from all the others is quite strong and it's not allowing this extremely small observation to be drawn out. But you can see that my distribution is biased heavily towards the, the line which represents the what the observed value is. But it's actually a much better um, prediction of what the liberal vote will be like in Northern Territory than just a raw number. Finally, I need to quickly, I don't know, I, my stuff's a bit out of order, so let me just quickly run back. Um, so why not? Okay, so this sounds really great and everything, but there are issues. MCMCs are not quick. Bayesian inference is really, really slow. Um, like, talking about the emotion recognition question, I did the, the frequentist version like 30 seconds, Bayesian version took like six hours. That's not like, and that's, you know, it could be sped up and improved and optimized, but there is a definitely a time, in, you know, constraint going on there. Doing the modeling, setting it up, there's no easy package, just pull it and, you know, train model. You have to do a lot of work to get the model into a good place. <laughs> Interpreting the results, you don't just get a number out, you get like a distribution out. That requires more time to also look at. It's slow all around. There's no real procedure either. Like, you know, in a, in a data science sector, you're like, here's my data set, let's split training, test, let's do some exploratory data analysis, let's try and evaluate in the full data set. There's a whole procedure there, everyone understands it. When you're trying to do Bayesian inference the first time, you have to explain it to everyone else, and that is really tough. Being able to do it is one level of skill, being able to explain it to another person is a whole other level of skill. Being able to automate it, also difficult. It's hard, it requires a lot of insight. You have, you have other issues that go in, like the label switching problem I talked about beforehand, and the significant time investment. No good. Um, so anyway, finally, how, does someone, how could someone get started in Bayesian inference? Just, I think I've talked about a lot of advantages you can have. How do you learn about this stuff? There's a really, really great book called Statistical Rethinking by Richard McElrath. Absolutely fantastic, and I think that if you want to understand Bayesian inference, it's the, my, the one true source for me. Um, there's also books like Think Based by Downey, which is a nice, light, and an easy intro. Bayesian Method for Hackers is there if you want to get started but don't want to commit much time at all. And of course, once you've got a good grounding, Bayesian, the OG book, Bayesian Data Analysis by Gelman is the final thing. But additionally, um, if you're interested, um, DSAI will be running a study group um, on, that, on statistical rethinking. So if you're interested in learning Bayesian inference, um, go to the dsiai.org.au to have a look, and we'll be running the course uh, shortly. Thing is, I want to talk about Bayesian techniques. So I mentioned a few of these before. Of the ones that you actually need to care about, I'd say a variational inference and MCMCs. I'm not going to go into the information much, but variational inference is needed when you have a really complex model, and MCMCs are really, really flexible. So you kind of, in your kind of inference, you're probably going to do a bit of both, mostly MCMCs. And finally, what are some good Bayesian software? So STAN is a piece of software that Michael Bettencourt, who was presented last month, talked about. And you will keep running into the STAN, the streaming website, um, which is actually not <laughs> what you want to use. STAN is probably the most mature package out there. There's also Edward, which is going to become like TensorFlow probability. There's PyMC3, which is going to become PyMC4, and it looks like it's going to have a tight relationship with TensorFlow. There's also a package called Pyro, which is also for Python. This is interesting for like Bayesian neural networks, if anyone's interested in that. Finally, last thing, why should you care about Bayesian inference? And I think there's a few things. So I think the problems of tomorrow are not the problems of big data sets, but the problems of small data sets. And I don't think frequentism is a good answer for that, but Bayesianism do. More questions of causality. I think that's, you know, we're, we've now kind of realized the limitations of correlation as a causal measure. We need to actually investigate causality for real. Auto ML is another big thing that I'm seeing come big. Like, you know, the ability to just click and run, you know, like thing like H2O.AI. It's sort of taking anything that's standard operating procedure is likely to be automated. Like, you know, I automate a lot of stuff. Things that I, that I did like five years ago, I'm not doing anymore. And that's kind of the thing. The industry keeps changing. I think Bayesian inference is, no, is the next step for a lot of the people in the space. And finally, it's at fundamentals. You have, there's no way to hide as a Bayesian. 
you have to have a good fundamental structure. And being, having that ability to talk about that, it's transferable to any new hype <laughs> that comes along. So that's why I think you should learn Bayesian inference, and that's why. Thanks. Um, yeah, sure. Um, that's actually a good point. That there is an implicit thing that Bayesian inference. I would think that using as you know certain areas models, you kind of have such a big space. You do need to have take the frequency approach. And I would argue that there's a lot of issues. That, a lot of not everyone's using like really untracked need, needs complex models to do good inference. There are a lot of models that are quite simple that do a very good job. And Bayesian inference is great there. When it talks about untracked models, Bayesian neural networks, deep probabilistic programming does exist. Um, it uses variational inference to help reduce the complexity space, and it does allow you to propagate uncertainty through a lot better. Um, as to saying, like, is it something I can use um, in, an un in, an intract in a problem like that? I don't necessarily say yes. I can't necessarily say that's the right thing to do. I think you do have to use, when you have a lot of complex data and a complex model, sometimes frequentism is the best way to go. It's sort of a tool to sort of have, when you, for different problems require different tools, and you don't want to use frequentism for everything, because there is another alternative approach out there. Um, that's another thing. Like, yeah. So, I mean, first of all, we, we don't always get time series. We're not going to see, most of the time we don't get this clear, like, one steps up, the next one steps up, and next, the next step afterwards. What if they both went up at the same time? That doesn't answer which is causal there. It's actually, and as I said, it's very difficult to tell any causal relationship when you have only two variables. And yeah, if there's a time series and you see, like, once move up and the next one move up, and you can actually intervene and see them change, yes, you could argue that that's causal. But a lot of the time, you don't actually have that as nice setup to like argue causality. You have like data sets, and like you know, let's say a change in one thing can flow into different variables. Let's say you have ten variables, and you know the change in one flows on in instantly to other variables. And how do you tell which one is the actual cause of an outcome? That's not so clearly defined. Causality, in a simple sense, maybe you can have an argument. Causality, in a more complex real-world sense, I don't think there's a good answer in frequentism or correlation. Uh, my question to you is, sure. um, so you compared the linear regression for, for the use case, right? Yep. But deep neural networks are talking about image classification yep. and text you know, classification, those kind of problems. Sure. 
does Beijing has any role to play there? Um, so I think this kind of talks back to Ben's question. There, look, I'm, first thing I'm trying to argue is there are a lot of problems that as data science we've solved that don't actually get into any way like image classification. Um, for example, when I worked in parliament, a lot of surveys of about 2,000 people that I had to like, do good inference on. There are a lot of questions that I've experienced in the past that don't have a good answer in frequentism. In the sense of talking about image classification, I think the existing neural net frequentist approaches are really, really good and really strong. Um, but there are some alternatives in the Bayesian sense. There is some, about 2015 or so, Bayesian neural nets became quite popular and I suspect Google's doing a lot of work in that area. Today, if you want to do a Bayesian neural net, I wouldn't say it's necessarily feasible, but maybe in 10 years from now, five years from now, it could be. But I just think there's a whole class of different class of problems that we have that we can look at different ways. Thank you, Arun, for the talk. Thank you. Hi, Greg Pearl from Northbridge IT Recruitment. Um, just hope you enjoyed tonight's presentations. Uh, I've been sponsoring the Data Science Sydney Meetup for the last six years with regard to, to videoing all of the presentations. Just a heads up, if you're looking for any past presentations, please go to the Data Science Sydney YouTube site. There would be over 30 to 40 various presentations. I think it'd be good to, to go back and catch up on. Northbridge IT Recruitment, specialist IT recruitment firm, uh, working across government, uh, large corporates, and startups. Personally, I focus on the data area, specifically data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. If you'd like to speak to me about individuals who are looking for their next role, please reach out, make contact. Any organizations looking for their next data superstar, please give me a call. There's plenty of really good people out there at the moment, and I'm very well networked in this marketplace, so I can definitely help. I look forward to seeing you at the next Data Science Meetup. Please don't forget, look at the uh, YouTube channel for those past presentations, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Take care.